So just for the record, thank you, Martin. Thank you uh, for inviting me. It's, uh, a, it has been an excellent opportunity for me uh, to follow uh, what Clarin is doing. And I have to say, I'm pretty new <coughs> to uh, be introduced to this project, and it was very enriching. And what I want to present is what I have been doing for uh, several years now. Uh, uh, well, going back to my first academic recordings, uh, it would be more than 10 years on different projects, uh, bits and pieces and bigger projects as well. Uh, what I'm doing now is um, using largely uh, the visual history archive, and that's for several reasons. Uh, the one reason is working on Holocaust survivors in Greece from Czech Republic does mean that I am limited in being in Greece permanently while teaching at the Charles University. What is the uh, uh, very positive thing about the Visual History Archive is that I can fully access it in Prague. So I can do a lot of my work on testimonies from, from Prague. But you will hear about the obstacles I am facing as well. Uh, well, what's my aim and what's the output of what I am doing? Uh, you may be surprised, it's a book. It's nothing, you know, it's, it's a book. <laughs> it's not a web page, it's not digital, it's not multimedia, it's nothing. It's a book which I would like people to buy, tank in a train going to London and read it page by page and be thrown away by the story that I am telling them, and which is a true story, with real names. And that's one of the obstacles you may know. Uh, with uh, a story I want to tell, and you are waiting for next page, if your person, your protagonist will get married, uh, will find a job with the qualities they have, will uh, find a way in his or her life because of the terrible experience of Auschwitz, how it will all end up, who is it? This is my modest aim. <laughs> uh, I, I really don't want to do that digital because for me, and I feel overwhelmed sometimes by all the technologies. I want a rest. I, maybe I may buy a book on a Kindle, but even back there, I want to have a nice reading a nice reading of history. And that's my aim, which may be in very opposition of many things we were speaking about and, and which are incredibly interesting for me. But I really want a simple book. So that's just for the beginning. Uh, I am not working only uh, with oral testimonies and uh, audiovisual testimonies. I'm working with many other sources as a historian. I am using um, uh, archival sources, printed sources, handwritten sources, uh, newspapers, uh, memoirs published and non-published letters, photographs with full descriptions where the uh, donor brought it to the museum and told the archivist the full story and they documented it. Uh, so there are a lot of different varieties of uh, material I am using for the purpose of writing a book about only a few years in post-war Greece of a minority which survived a genocide. Uh, but because I am presenting on oral testimonies in here, I will focus on what I can, uh, um, I can work with and what are my experiences. So I will come back to the visual, uh, visual history archive. I tried to use uh, testimonies, very valuable testimonies, of uh, uh, Holocaust survivors who emigrated in very early post-war period uh, to Palestine, Israel. Uh, I am facing two problems. In order not to pay for the testimonies, I would need to go to Israel and to see them there. Uh, Otherwise, it's more or less blind research, which I base on a person, which I know from memoirs, from documentation, and I have only a guess if what is in the interview uh, can be use, useful for me, and then I pay for it, and then I get it in Hebrew, and that's the other problem. Uh, even if um, I am very lucky to be able to work in about 10 uh, foreign languages, at least passively, uh, and in some of them actively. 
Hebrew, it's not among them. So I am facing the language problem, which uh, has been uh, proposed as a possible problem uh, for many kinds of research, and that's one of the problems I have. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, in Yad Vashem, as, as uh, strange as it may sound, when I ask for a testimony which was recorded on a record of six hours, I got a transcription, which was a transcription of an hour of the interview, but somehow wrapped up. So I don't know what I really had, and I had to bother other colleagues to help me out with the Hebrew, which in fact wasn't really what I would get at that spot, and then I would need another Hebrew listener who will translate it to me, not knowing the Greek words, and I would translate to him or her and explain her uh, the Greek realia and so on. So it's, it's very challenging, but it would be very important and there is a reason why these people decided to deliver uh, uh, their testimony in the Hebrew. They don't want Greeks to understand, many of them. So many of them were persecuted after the war because of being communist partisans, and the only place and language I can get the information from is the Hebrew testimony, and there is no other material. So it's very useful, but I am still struggling. Then there is a, a, a U.S. Holocaust Memorial uh, Museum audio collection, uh, uh, which is largely accessible even online, and I can only advise everybody who is using that form of material uh, in teaching that it's, it's a very rich one, and it has a very good transcription. The problem for me is uh, that uh, they have very few narrators from Greece, and they have only those who emigrated to the United States or lived in the United States. So I am getting only a very small segment of my story. The other one is a fortune of uh, video archive, which is accessible only on campus and which is anonymized. Uh, it's a huge obstacle for me. I, I managed to identify uh, the no-name uh, narrators and to put them together because of the voice, because of the life story uh, from that testimonies. Uh, but officially, I shouldn't use the names uh, for them. And, and I'm still struggling with anonymized uh, interviews because for you, when you will read my book, you don't want to read MP1 for male partisan number one and uh, MP number 25 for male, male partisan 25. So just think about how you read what I am giving to you after you get the result. Um, I used to use Centropa, uh, uh, which is an online uh, archive, but for or my purpose, this is disappearing. And that's another very important question, and it's the sustain, uh, sustainability. So interviews, which I was uh, able to listen to five years ago, don't exist online anymore. I don't know if there was a problem with personal rights or uh, another problem, but what I had isn't available anymore. So uh, as for Greece, it, it just disappeared. Jewish Museum of Greece, and that would be another thing which was largely discussed, it's a unique collection of more than 100 testimonies. Um, um, I was lucky enough to, to uh, record for them as well, so, uh, so I know somehow the process. The problem is, is everything on Menedisc or even cassettes and so on. Huge collection, accessible only on a spot, not advertised at internet at all. So you have to be an insider to know that they have such a treasure hidden somewhere uh, in the streets of Athens where you have to apply and then you have very limited hours to access the collection even during the week. So for me to listen to uh, carefully to about 10 to 20 testimonies would cost me this year definitely about two weeks. Uh, just for your time frame, how it works. What was most help, uh, helpful, and I will come back to that, uh, is a database uh, which is a kind of meta database, um, or is a meta database, uh, which I will briefly introduce because I think it may be helpful for many of us. So what is in the Visual History Archive? The Visual History Archive has uh, 51,000 uh, audiovisual t testimonies uh, which were recorded as live stories. Uh, 
it's not only about survivors of Holocaust, even if about 49,000 of them are the survivors of Holocaust, largely defined, which means people in hiding, people in resistance, and so on and so on, and other genocide. That's not my focus. We are from 56 countries in 31 languages. Now, as for Greece, I was interested to cover everything because some of you may have heard of Thessaloniki, Salonika, the uh, Madri Israel, uh, uh, Israel, the Jerusalem of Balkans, and so on and so on. Uh, not the post-war story was told, but I don't want to uh, make the impression uh, and to feed the impression that that was the only community in Greece because the case is very different. So I try to cover all the 33 locations uh, where interviews were recorded, and they were recorded in 11 different languages. So I have 607 uh, uh, people born in Greece, recorded half of it in Greece and another half of it out of Greece. But I have another ones which I wanted to identify, which were not born in Greece, but in the Ottoman Empire, because we still have to have in mind the structure of, of, of empires uh, um, from the beginning of 20th century, which were disappearing. And of course, I have other ones which I identify some, uh, sometimes by chance, sometimes uh, because I knew them, and so on and so on, who were born somewhere else. Yugoslavia, before that, as a part of Ottoman Empire, then uh, out of Ottoman Empire. Egypt, with a very large Greek and Greek-Jewish uh, uh, community, wrote and caused, which for you is a part of Greece. But it became a part of Greece in 47, and their personal identification is completely different. So you can have Turkey, you can have Italy, you can have Ottoman Empire, you can have only road without giving a country. And it, it's, it's very tricky, but it's important to cover these parts of the world. So, what I can, uh, how do I search? Uh, I have experience group search which is useful, but, and I will come back to, be, uh, to that. Index search, people search, you have to know the name, more or less, which is very tricky because we have another alphabet used and trans uh, transliterated in a very different way with a very different tradition. Uh, most usual problem, which may be solved after clicking for 20 times, is the name Cohen. So if you, uh, if you write it in Greek, you would start with K. Uh, uh, you can put a, um, uh, um, a H in the middle, but an H doesn't exist in Greek, but they know it from other literature, so sometimes they write it with C. I, I found about seven varieties of the name Cohen in different uh, databases, and very often it's the very same person. And in a country where you usually get to the, uh, give to the kid the name of uh, his grandfather or grandmother, you are facing a serious problem. So everybody in the family is, uh, has the same name, but uh, everybody is written in a different form. So you have an Aaron with double A or with one A or whatever. So, uh, well, that's, that's what I am facing. And I don't have some of the wonderful tools which may help to, so, uh, to, to solve my problem. But Again, I dubbed that visual history archive. Well, from now on, use the wonderful tools you presented here, and I still, until my book is finished, will fight with this very same problem. I have indexing terms, which may be geographical, which may be historical, which may be famous names, perpetrators during the war, or the head of the community, or the uh, prime minister of Greece, and so on, which can be, again, transliterated in many different forms, or which may be lacking completely because the interviewer didn't index them because he didn't know the name or she didn't know the name. So he or she didn't bother to write a German name or, or the Greek name if it's in United States, or it, they wrote it in a completely wrong way. Uh, and famous institutions, which again um, is tricky for me as a historian because having a famous uh, resistance fighters institution may mean uh, that the person was like, in a completely different one or in none, uh, but of course uh, the feeling of belonging somewhere was so strong that they presented themselves as members of an institution. And that's something which no machine can really solve. Uh, no program can solve. 
periodization. So, so this comes to the historical uh, uh, index terms, and that was pretty useful. But as you see, for my years, 44, which are not even considered as the end of the Second World War in Greece, uh, there is nothing. And going to 51, I have to search through all uh, of these categories somehow anyway. So I uh, already spoke about the distant, uh, distant use of uh, data and, and what are my problems and, and what I am facing. Uh, it's uh, only a summary uh, of uh, what, are, uh, what are the real troubles I was fighting with. Now, uh, very briefly, experience group search. Name of the interview in many different forms, and, and the red lines are those which I will touch upon uh, in more details, but you have all the categories which are in the archive. Date of birth, uh, no birth certificate, very often uh, wrong name and date of birth. Very often it's, it's incredible to see that people are putting their birthday on important uh, days of the year for the country uh, that uh, many people are doing, uh, are making themselves younger or older because it suits the purpose. So uh, female are mostly younger, males are mostly older, which, <laughs> which, uh, which is a general experience I did. But again, in every, even if you think you have the date of birth and now you are going on and, and your research will be smooth, then you realize you have five different date of births and years of births differing by up to eight years. Uh, country of birth, and I already uh, said it, with dissolution of empires, I am troubled. Um, country of interview was for me a very important indicator because I realized that interviews recorded in a, a country which I am interested in, which in my case is Greece, are going much more in depth in details of events which were happening. If I have an interview of a Greek Holocaust survivor recorded in South Africa or in the uh, United States, uh, very probably the interviewer will focus in a part on post-war period, much more on a period once they came to that country. And they won't be bothered a a at all about the three, four, five, ten years these people spent immediately after the war in Greece because they don't really guess what was happening that there and that's not that important for them. And the guidelines are saying you should report 20 per, uh, record 20% about post-war. But what is the post-war? And the experience groups, we, uh, which, which is a very, uh, the experiences, uh, which is a very problematic category once many people are answering yes or no. Not helpful at all. So I will give you a case of uh, Coast Road uh, um, area where I was about to find somebody who survived the Holocaust and who was somehow affiliated, grew up, uh, was living in Kos. And that was Sultana or Susanne, Levi or Lev or whatever you can imagine. That's the uh, young lady in 1947 when she got married. It was only less than two years after she, she came back from Auschwitz. So you do see the picture of normality, which is so questionable in this case. And now you see that Greece didn't help me at all. So the city of birth is Bodrum in Turkey, because it was with a boat only a few kilometers, and her father was doing business over there, and she, by chance, was born in Turkey. So not cost at all. Uh, country of birth, uh, of birth, Ottoman Empire, ghettos and uh, camps. And here I was lucky because very often the survivors aren't mentioning other camps than uh, German camps. So I was lucky here to have a Greek camp, but that wasn't the way I found her really. Location of liberation, not useful uh, for Greece. Uh, location of interview, not useful for Greece. Language of interview, not useful for Greece. So I went to the uh, geographical search. And you do see you have quite a lot of interviews if you zoom on Greece. Uh, and I had to zoom farther. And I realized that there is only one testimony from Kos, and I was there. So using different tools in different ways really, uh, helped me a lot. So what are my basic problems? 
insufficient uh, language knowledge, as many languages as I may speak, it's not enough. Quality of indexing, uh, lacking information for many purposes. Sometimes you don't want to, sometimes you don't bother because it's too much work, sometimes you don't want to name the people, sometimes you don't know the area, uh, sometimes you think it won't be interesting for anyone, uh, sometimes it gives you a completely different uh, context as anti-Semitism. So if you have the indexing term anti-Semitism, very often the narrator is saying, oh, anti-Semitism, I didn't consider anything as an anti-Semitism. And you are looking forward to have your anti-Semitism story, and it's not there. Uh, so uh, um, there are many problems like this. Lack of matter database uh, and information, and I will come back to that very quickly. Uh, absence of uh, software, uh, software for storing diverse uh, data forms, and I will come back uh, with that, and I already spoke with several colleagues here who may help me out in what I am doing. Uh, because this lady was one of about 300 I am using for the post-war story. And national legislations on personal data and copyright, and that's a big trouble too. I really don't want to analyze. I think it will ruin my story. It will ruin what I am doing. And it will not give you the pleasure of reading. It will be, again, just a book for a few researchers on post-World uh, uh, War II, post-conflict uh, um, uh, situations and so on. But it won't be a story for people who should read it and who should, should enjoy the reading, at least, even if it's a very diff difficult topic. The metadatabase, I was very lucky with one metadatabase. And again, it's about uh, sustainability. This database is now uh, frozen. So nothing new is added. The things they didn't find aren't in there, but it's still a very good hint. So I can, uh, they're pretty good with uh, different koans, let's say. Uh, so they will find all the versions in uh, 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 transliterated in uh, Latin script or in Greek. I gave you the, uh, uh, the um, English version, of course, for the purpose that I guess there won't be that many Greek speakers. Um, I have a basic annotation, but this lady is a very unique uh, lady in a way, or a fr and from a very unique family, where four of the members of the family survived Auschwitz, mother, father, son, and daughter. One of the families survived as a partisan in the mountains in, uh, in uh, Greece. Uh, what's interesting, too, that one of the kids wasn't born in Greece, but in Karlsbad in Czechoslovakia because of a business trip of the parents at that time. Both of the uh, siblings, both of the kids, uh, brought their testimonies among the first ones and published them among the first ones in Greece, which is in the 80s. But still, much earlier, 10 years earlier than anything was really recorded. They spoke, both of them spoke about uh, uh, four foreign languages. So once they were asked to, uh, uh, to publish the translation in other languages, in the four uh, languages, they proofread it and changed what they wanted. So we have a lot of uh, translations where this book is the one published in Greece, but we don't have all the translations, which would be very useful, too. We don't have all the interviews either, because Erika was very often visiting uh, radios, television, and so on, and so on. So this database could go much farther. And we don't have nearly at all information on her family and on what his, uh, her father was doing after the war uh, in Greece, delivering a lot of speeches how it was to survive Auschwitz and so on. So we don't know that there is this link between family members. And we don't know that Erika's husband survived in uh, Africa, joining the uh, exile army and so on. So there would be so much metadata which we could put together and it's not only about the prison, it's about the network. And that's exactly what I am aiming for, because the story is not about a single person. So what I need is this in an electronic version, because my wall is not big enough. I can't put on my wall 300 names. Which means that, guys, what we could do <laughs> and what would be great are these 
points, bullet points that I have on the board. And I would just stop uh, shortly with the last point, and it's a lobbying for common legislation. And I think, and I, I didn't hear it that often, but the legal aspect is hitting us so badly. Doesn't matter if we are historians, if uh, we are linguists, if whatever we are doing. But personal data, copyright, and so on, it would be great. I can go to a library and copy 20% of a book. I can hardly go to an archive with audio uh, visual material and say, come on, give me your 20% of the post-war, and uh, I will push it into the machine and the program you are uh, suggesting as a perfect tool. But I won't get even the 20% very often. And that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you for your attention.